Hi, right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Discovering Multifamily Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Scandariato with Red Knight Properties. And boy, do we have a cool show for you guys today. George Abreu it joins us, and he's a veteran in real estate, so it's always good to hear from uh, individuals who've been around for a long time, have seen multiple cycles, uh, currently in a in an interesting cycle right now in the real estate industry, industry specifically with uh, multifamily properties. And George um, has also started and built a construction company, which is really interesting. He's pretty much fully integrated, vertically integrated. Um, this construction company brings in over $20 million in yearly revenue. He's an active and passive full-time multifamily real estate invest investor. He has a um, company called Elevate. They have about 7,000 units as the deal sponsors, and they've <laughs> gone through multiple exits and refinances. And right now they have almost $500 million of units uh, and assets under management. Uh, but today we're, we're going to focus on um, how George was able to build his construction company as well as his multifamily uh, syndication uh, business. Um, he's primarily focused in the Southeast from what I understand, right, George? And uh, yeah, yeah. His goal is to reach about 10,000 doors by the end of 2022, uh, which is only a few months from now. So very curious to hear how he's doing with that. And uh, yeah, we'd love to hear about the construction company and, and why why did you choose to, I guess, start that as well as invest in multifamily real estate? Okay. Well, thank you, Anthony. Pleasure to be on. Um, Making me feel a little old there, but uh, I have been... <laughs> In real estate for a while now, it's been uh, about. I didn't 16. mean to do that. <laughs> it is what it is, man. Um, you know, the good thing is I, I have experienced uh, different real estate cycles. Um, you know, I was doing real estate full time before the bubble bursted in in '08. Um, went through that, made adjustments, and you know, here we are now on the brink of another recession. Uh, not the same fundamentals as the last one for sure, but nonetheless, you know, there, there's going to be some type of correction if it's not happening already. Um, and not, not to go too deep into, into that. I know you wanted to cover the construction stuff. So I'll start to kind of unwrap that. Um, so 16 years ago, right. I started investing in single family real estate, um, and my goal was to scale that. And to do that, a brick wall I kept running into was finding good contractors and just finding contractors that did a good job in general. Um, I felt that I had the experience and the skill sets to go ahead and bring that in house and start um, my own construction company. So, that was about 12 years ago, went ahead and did that. And it worked, you know, we were able to, to ramp up. We were doing a lot of fix and flips. We had some holds, um, some smaller multifamily stuff as well, but we were mainly, you know, doing somewhere to 50 to 60 fix and flips a, a year. Um, and the construction company helped a ton with that, you know, learned, learned a lot for sure. Um, in that, uh, growing that company. And then about six years ago is when I began to make my move into multifamily syndication, large multifamily properties. And as I did that, I also, you know, put all my focus on the construction to the same thing. Um, and it's helped a lot in our growth within multifamily as well. Cause one, we're able to know what we're getting into as far as CapEx. We're able to possibly make better offers because we're not guessing on a lot of this stuff. You know, we know exactly what it's going to cost and what it's going to take to to execute on our business plan. Uh, it's also got us into some co-GP situations where, you know, other investors find a deal and, and it's got a decent amount of CapEx and they want somebody on the ownership to really run that and, um, you know, make sure that that plan gets executed. So we've also got ourselves into a lot of, a lot of deals that way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been pretty crucial to, to our growth. Um, 
you know, it's not for everybody. I will say that, you know, being vertically integrated, it's not for everybody in general. Um, we're also working on bringing management in-house now too. And um, we held off for a while. You know, like you said, we're, we've acquired over 7,000 units now. Um, we have had some exits, so we don't have a total of 7,000 under management right now more like 5,000 something, I believe, but, um, uh, we just kept putting it off until, until we could. Um, we did, a, we focused a lot on asset management and really pushing the third party management companies. Um, but I think we pushed them as far as we can. And the next step is to just bring it in house. Sure. And where are you based, George? So I'm based out of Dallas, Dallas, Texas. You're based out of Dallas, and I understand you have properties in Texas, Oklahoma, Georgia, South Dakota, any other states? Uh, South Carolina, and we're getting ready to close on some in Florida, and I think that covers it for now. But we're, okay. we're pretty open on, on location-wise. You know, we feel comfortable. Um, there's certain markets we're, we're looking for, right? We're looking for those, those population growth, job growth type markets that still have room to grow as far as pricing goes and, and kind of chasing, I don't want to say chasing the yield, but you know, we, we do also invest in, in major markets, but even in those major markets, we kind of like finding those smaller markets um, on the outside of the, of the major Metro ones that, that still have room for growth as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm surprised you held off management for this long, uh, just because primarily the, at least with our properties that we own, we own multifamily as well. And the hardest, yes, the one of the hardest part is to, you know, make sure you're collecting rent on time and, you know, making sure the units, you know, turned over properly. And that typically involves, you know, at least on our end, if we're doing a heavy turn and outside contractor. So, I think the management aspect should be pretty seamless. It's just more of a human resources and infrastructure uh, overhead uh, project for for you guys to take on at this point. Uh, but it's awesome. You guys have uh, built your portfolio up to a certain amount of units where, okay, it's starting to make sense to why are we outsourcing management when we have construction. Um, what has been your largest pain points with your construction company. So you started out with the, the, the fix and flips and you kind of built your um, relationships through there. Uh, do you just kind of have someone with their boots on the ground and the markets that you're operating in to find, uh, dif you know, different uh, labor force participants? Um, it's like you mentioned, you're moving into Florida, like you have to build out a whole new team in Florida, right? Unless you have the same crews that can shift between different states. How does that, how does that work? Yeah, so we do all, all our project managers and site supervisors, they all know that travel is part of their job description and, and they've got to be able to travel. And then we do have crews that will pick up and go. They, they don't mind. They go where the work's at. Um, you know, they like to stay busy. So that helps. Usually if we're in a brand new market, we're going to bring um, one of those traveling crews and we're going to start the project that way. And usually throughout the life of the, the project, we begin to build relationships that are local. And eventually we start replacing those traveling crews with the local crews. Um, and, you know, just building out the company in general, there's also a lot with the back office and accounting, you know, when, when it comes to a construction company, I think a lot of construction companies that fail our lack of accounting and being able to really uh, track their job cost and know their overhead and whatnot. So um, that's something that we do really well. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And then when you bring on the property management, you're going to have to do the books for your properties too. So uh, yeah. I'm assuming you have the infrastructure to, to have that. Uh, working on it. Yeah. Working on it. Okay. Cool. Um, so you mentioned uh, for the audience, you mentioned you got some co-GP positions when you added value with your construction background. Uh, I think that's an interesting um, value add. 
um, to any, you know, multifamily syndication. Sometimes you see syndications with a few different partners and uh, I get deals from other sponsors, syndicators who are putting deals together and there's like eight people on the deal and it's like a $15 million deal. And I don't know half of their value in um, for being on the deal, just maybe just to put the money in. Um, but it's really awesome that you have that, uh, the construction in house, and then you have the experience with the syndications as well and, and investments. So uh, could you talk to us how some of those deals were structured? Um, like, is it really, has your need really been for heavy, heavy value add multifamily syndications or have they been more opportunistic, like ground up type of, you know, partnerships where you've been brought on? I'm just curious. I mean, it's really been all over the, the board. You know, there, there's definitely the heavy lift, right? That's the first thing you think of. If it's a heavy lift, you know, let's bring somebody in with construction management experience or with a construction company. Um, but even some of the lighter stuff, I mean, just something with a lot of unit turns, it's especially now with all the labor shortages and then the supply chain issues, uh, we we get materials, right? Like when others can't because of how much um, we do with our suppliers and how much materials we purchase, uh, we're on top of their list when it comes to, you know, when they get a, a set of appliances, they're calling us versus somebody else. Um, so I think that that has helped. You know, one, one thing I noticed when I got into this space was you had a lot of syndicators doing these deals and you know, their CapEx budget of 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, whatever it is. And they were just handing that money over to the property manager to manage this massive construction project. Um, and then sometimes they get ran poorly and, you know, the syndicators wonder why. And it's like, well, you've got nobody on your team that has experience and nobody's that that's watching them. And you're relying on a property manager to be a construction manager. So I, I felt like there was a, a space there that, that I could definitely add value to. Um, and, you know, others, I guess, felt the same way as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what has been, I guess, the largest, uh, what do you specialize in, in terms of on the multifamily side, uh, in terms of like your minimum unit count for, I guess, for both, you know, the investing side on the active and passive and the construction side, like we, would you take on like a 50 unit project or is that too small? Like, what are you looking for? I, I wouldn't purchase anything under a hundred for the most part. Um, you know, unless it's really close to one of our other assets. Um, on the construction side, we, we may take a third party um, work for something smaller if, overall the the scope is is large you know if you're doing a 50 unit and you're completely rebranding it redoing the exteriors and doing the interior units then you know that's something that we we might be interested in but um do you just do a lot of third party um we we do here and there you know we we've, we've got quite a bit going on in-house but um i do like working with other investors and and building that relationship okay um Go ahead, I, I cut you off. It's all right. It's all right. So, you know, as far as our own projects, we like to stick in the 100 plus unit range um, just for uh, managing the properties a lot easier. You got on site staff um, and whatnot. But like I said, on the construction, maybe we would do something less. Yeah. And, and you mentioned you have your own uh, supply chain pretty much built out. Do you have warehouses for? storage and inventory or how does how does that work for you yeah so we, we've got a, a warehouse in, in dallas um, where we do so, store some materials um on other projects though we just first thing we do is we or, we order storage containers and and we start keeping the materials there so what has been your greatest challenge you mentioned the, the labor force uh finding good employees it is early over the past couple of years and have you seen the supply chain kind of unwinding a little bit? I mean, I'm sure it's item by item, like appliances might be a little bit easier now and certain yeah. items, right? Like what, what is your, what are your thoughts? It comes and goes with, with certain items. Um, you know, appliances has been a big one throughout. There, there was a time 
you know, we were stocking up on, on appliances on every single project. Um, it, it got better. And then a few weeks back, it, it, it got kind of crazy again. So it's kind of, you know, roller coaster on that end, but there's been other specialty items are, are tough. You know, if it's something that you don't regularly need, um, those have definitely taken a while to come in. Um, and then to answer your question, as far as the, the company itself, um, definitely, you know, finding the right team members. And, and um, I honestly think project, a project manager, the construction project manager is probably one of the hardest positions to fill. Um, it takes a certain character to be able to do that. Um, you know, you've got to be able to get stuff done on the field. You've got to be able to be organized at the same time. You've got to, um, it's a lot of office and field work mixed in together. Mm -hmm. So it definitely takes somebody special to, to be able to handle that. Um, we've been lucky to, to find a, a good team, but it, it's taken, um, you know, some hiring and firing for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and so you mentioned that and how many do you currently have on staff, like project manager, construction manager? We've got about eight in total. Okay. And in terms of the type of um, multifamily assets you're both investing in and doing the construction on, is it is it more high end um, class A or is it kind of all across the board, anywhere from C to A? Um, it's, like, I'm just curious what type of finishes you're putting in your properties. It's a good mixture at this point. You know, if you would have asked me that maybe two or three years ago, it would have been mainly C-class assets. Um, but we we're doing a lot more A-class these days. So it's, it's, it's a good mixture right now, 50-50 or so. Nice. And you, you've seen the higher end, um, materials easier to source right now or uh not necessarily i mean stainless steel appliances have been rough um this entire time it's been it's been hard to source those um we've had to you know, i know one project where we we had to buy all the fridges all at once and and we stored them on site because um we couldn't find them anywhere and then they came up with a supplier. So we went ahead and just took advantage and grabbed the ball. Um, countertops haven't been tough. Um, the fixtures is about the same with the, with the plumbing and, and lighting, whether it's low end or, or high end. Um, you know, I'm sure if you try going to maybe like really high end stuff, but we're not, we're not doing any of that. Um, you know, paint has been, we've had to adjust a lot on, on paint to get, um, it's also weird, you know, hit or miss though. Sherwin Williams will be out of a certain paint. So then we got to go to PG or bear and, and just mix it around. What about flooring? Uh, flooring, you know, we haven't had a lot of delays on the flooring. We, uh, that one's been pretty consistent. Our pricing has gone up. But, yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> but the yeah, as far as the delays, it there hasn't been many. How about bathroom materials, tubs? No, no issues there. Oh, that's good. And are, are you large, large electrical panels? Is is huge. So on. Yeah. Um, gear systems. Like if you're having to replace a whole, you know, we 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 got some hotel to multifamily projects in Florida and you know, we we're just getting quoted uh, 200 and something days to change out the main uh, service mm -hmm. meter. Um, so I know those, that's been one of the largest delays for sure. As like the old federal Pacific aluminum wiring type of. No, no, it's a, it's a, an eighties build and um you know, I was able to talk the engineer, the engineer into leaving the existing so that we wouldn't have to have a 200 day delay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they were pushing to replace it just because 
he's an engineer and and I can say this because I'm an electrical engineer as well. Mm -hmm. That's my degree. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they try to be on the safer side, but there's no reason why we can't keep the, the existing. Awesome. And, um, yeah, no, it's a great conversation. I'd love to continue it more. Uh, obviously, we have to wind down the show. Uh, last question before we go. Uh, you mentioned you said you're at 5,000 units. I know you sold a, you know, a couple thousand or a thousand, um, and now you're trying to get to 10,000. Is that with the new acquisitions you have in Florida? And yeah, so that, that was mainly, you know, total acquisition count. Um, okay. But that was also set before the debt market went nuts. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm going to hit the 10,000 number by the end of this year. Um, maybe more like we've got a few pending right now. Uh, close to nine, maybe, but, but 8,000 something. Right. It's still quite an accomplishment. Uh, George, how can my audience find you? Um, you know, we, we update our website, um, constantly and that's elevatecig.com so it stands for commercial investment group elevatecig.com um, they can also email me at george or jorge j-o-r-g-e at elevatecig.com they tell me they listen to me on this podcast I'll make sure to send a arsenal of free content that I've got a bunch of checklists and other items nice that's awesome I'll definitely check it out for myself and if you liked what you heard and or saw today, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes. It helps George and I get our message out to a larger audience base and really appreciate it. And we'll have a link to George's website. He just mentioned an email in our social media and iTunes description. So feel free to reach out to him and check out some of his free content. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's great. So uh, thanks so much, George, for coming on our show. We'd love to have you back on. Absolutely, man. Thank you, Anthony. Take care.